Yes, hello. My talk here today is going to be about three ways of making games more inclusive. Um, that was what I was asked to talk about, and I tried to like narrow down the subject a little. And it all ended up a little more like three very specific in examples of inclusiveness from LARPs I've organized. So unlike many of the talkers here today, I'm not going to linger very much on the, uh, the theoretical parts. I'm, I'm going to focus on the examples, as, and then we can take the theoretical discussions later on Knutepunkt and things like that. But before I go on, um, I'm going to have a, a short part of theory anyways. I, I just can't keep myself. <laughs> and uh, at least you, you, you need to know my definition of, of what inclusiveness means. So here's one definition of inclusiveness. It's a term from sociology, and uh, this version is quite a technical one, but it's more or less about being culturally and socially accepted, welcome, and equally treated. Um, you, you could also have a, a, a little more personal definition of uh, inclusiveness, as here provided by the authors Judith Katz and Fredrik Miller, who are organizational consultants who work with organizational cultures and diversity and social equality, where they focus more on, on, um, on your own experience, the sense of belonging, feeling respected and valued for who you are. But for myself, as a LARP writer and as a LARP host and as a LARP organizer, I usually boil it down to one question, like I try to put myself in different participants' shoes and ask myself the question, do I feel like the organizers had someone like me in mind when they designed the game? Because answering that question more or less uh, provides a lot of these pieces, feeling uh, the feeling of belonging, being respected and valued for who you are. <coughs> And one, uh, um, one example of this, this do I feel like the organizers had someone like me in mind when they designed the game is uh, from a friend of mine who is uh, a role player. And um, she started reading tabletop uh, role playing books when she was like 15, 16. But all the tabletop role playing books she read, she felt like she was somewhat uh, an intruder in the hobby because they all, they all were written for men or, or males to, to read. So, so they, she felt like they weren't very welcoming until she read Vampire the Masquerade, uh, which she described to me as an epiphany, because at that time the World of Darkness authors had a guideline to every time they made an example of a player in the book, every other time they used a male example, and every other time they used the female example. And at that time she felt like, yeah, someone like me was intended to read this book, was intended to play this game. The feeling of belonging. <coughs> so if your aim is to make an inclusive game, uh, these are some of the questions that might be relative, uh, relevant to you. Who am I making this LARP for? Who will feel welcome? Who won't feel welcome but will be able to participate? And who won't even be able to participate? I'm not saying that all games have to be inclusive games. Uh, there are a lot of games who deliberately are made as not inclusive games, as a design choice. They are uh, excluding some people. And I'll return to that uh, for a short moment in my last slide. And uh, like, why is this so important to me? Why, why I thought a lot about this? I work, as uh, Johanna said, at the company Livexstaden. We make educational LARPs for schools. LARPs where we go out to the schools, make our LARPs as part of the education for the children. Um, these LARPs are very often, um, they are very often uh, uh, have uh, little preparation for the participants, not, not for us as organizers. <laughs> and uh, we have a varying group size. But the main thing in this context is compulsory participations. The children haven't chosen to go to my LARP or not. Uh, very often it's a teacher who have decided that we should take in one of your LARPs as part of our education. So the children have to be there, they can't opt out. And therefore, uh, me and my colleagues at Livewerkstaden have uh, done at least some thinking, I would say, about inclusiveness. <laughs> so, to my three examples. 
The first example is um, what I call the no wall of text. When we make our LARPs, we try to have as little uh, text as possible. Um, and, and as little manuals and descriptions as possible that they have to read beforehand. Because if you're a person who has a hard time acquiring uh, knowledge through text, then uh, that, that, like, that shouldn't be, be a thing. Everyone should be able to participate in, uh, in on the same terms as everyone else. So we have a lot of our times, uh, a lot of the information is given beforehand in preparation. The characters are very often made in workshops beforehand, so uh, that everyone has, has uh, we try to make everyone like get the, the same opportunity to get the knowledge. Um, but this also, of course, uh, like for instance, you could have a reading disability, but, but you have to think about other disabilities as well. Not everyone is an able-bodied person. Will it be able to have someone in a wheelchair at our LARP? Things like that are also things we think about. Um, and the, um, the second one uh, is the gender neutral roles. Very often we write our roles with not a specific gender in mind, so we write all the characters for the LARP, and then we either have a gender neutral name uh, like Robin or Alex, or we have multiple names uh, so that you can choose any one name you want. And these have, uh, this gives us a lot of perks. For instance, it's a way to stop ourselves from making stereotypically male or stereotypically female roles. This also goes for the non-playable characters. So all the non-playable characters in the LARPs are, um, are, are written in the same ma manner. And um, we give all the participants the the uh, we like tell them beforehand that they get to choose exactly how they want to play out their gender, which makes it easier for them than if we would have like male and female characters and they actively would have to go and ask for uh, a character of another other gender. And uh, uh, so, so uh, relating to this, you could play out your gender any way you want. But it, uh, also the relationships in the characters are written, uh, written in there, so we also get a different uh, representation of the different relationships that could occur. So it's not like important to, g to the game whether this is a heterosexual relationship or not. So a lot of different relationship constellations occur in our game uh, in a random manner. Um, and that uh, is like one strong point I think. It's also quite practical. Like you, uh, if you have uh, very little time, you could always just shuffle the characters and just hand them out. And the last one, uh, Elf Ears for Everyone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, th that may sound like a funny thing, but, but actually this is where I really made a mistake. So we have this one game where the, uh, the children, uh, a third of the children play goblins. And we ordered a lot of elf ears for them to play uh, these goblins. And um, we went out and had the LARP at different schools. And I didn't realize that, mm, that this was a problem before, and all the elf ears were white, of course, uh, because they were made in this latex material. And I was totally oblivious to my privilege until I actually went out and met all the children that we played with. I hadn't seen how this could be a problem beforehand, but it really put the spotlight on the question, is this a game that was designed where the organizers had someone like me in mind? So uh, nowadays we, we try to solve this problem either by providing, providing makeup for everyone, or uh, and we've also tried to find someone who can mold uh, elf ears in, in uh, a wide variety of colors, so that this won't be uh, an issue anymore. So if you want to make inclusive games, uh, the advice would be listen to your players, really listen to your players, hear what they have to say, and, uh, and just, just take the feedback. Question your design choices. Why do, do I do this? Is it out of habit or, or is it just because I, I think it's the way it should be done? But most importantly of all, never get complacent. Never reach a point where you think that, well, I'm inclusive enough. Uh, because then, like, we're not experts as this, at this. We're struggling every day to, to become more inclusive. 
it's more or less a sliding scale. You can't say that like now we have reached total <laughs> inclusiveness. Um, so, so that's why also the talk is called uh, to make games more inclusive. But the main takeaway point um, I want to make is this, that uh, there are many valid reasons for, for making games that aren't I inclusive. But when, I'm, I'm not going to say if, but when you make design choices that excludes people, when you make those choices, make sure that those are conscious, choice, co conscious choices and make sure that it wasn't due to lack of reflection on your part. That's what I want to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>